Hello and welcome to the first lecture for History 2. We're going to be going back a little bit in time before the period at which this course really should begin in order to give a greater knowledge of background information so that you can better appreciate what is going to be taking place. We're going to be going back then to that of the Protestant Reformation. And this is the period of time in which there is a growing dissatisfaction with some of the fundamentals of the Roman Catholic Church. And uh, there will be a split, a breaking away from the Roman Catholic Church. Now, because this is such a fundamental feature of European society, the Church, the Roman Catholic Church, people need more than just one simple reason for why it is that they should break with something that their fathers, uh, their forefathers, uh, back and back through time, have lived with. People who seek great change need great reasons for that change. And so there are quite a number of different reasons for why it is that people will break from the Roman Catholic Church to create the Protestant Reformation. Now, not everyone follows each and every one of these rules. Some only will follow maybe a very few of them. Uh, but by and large, these are the overarching ideas that uh, they will use to solidify in their minds why it is that they want to break from the church. And they break down into a number of different groups. The first is religious, and the next is political and then economic, intellectual, and then various other things. So let's uh, go through these in turn. Perhaps the most important for the majority of people are the religious reasons. And there are a variety of these religious reasons. The first is this idea that the Roman Catholic Church had over time come to depart too greatly from the early church as it was presented in the New Testament. And there were those who claimed that these early testaments, uh, the scriptures, are the ones that should become the sole source for Christian dogma. Whereas the Roman Catholic Church believed that because there had been time and new ideas and new revelations from God, that those should also be incorporated into Christian dogma as well. Then there is also the idea of a, um, a direct relationship with God, that people could be their own priest, if you will. They could read the Bible and follow its rules on their own. They didn't need the priesthood. They didn't need the sacraments. Those are much less important than the individual following their path. Uh, other problems that uh, arose under the religious heading is the idea of the Petrine doctrine. The, and this also goes back to the departure from the early church as well, in that in the New Testament, where you see uh, letters that are being written from various bishops to one another, and you can see within these that each bishop is more or less equal to every other bishop. There is no one head of the church, and therefore there are individual flavorings, if you will, uh, based upon the region in which these bishops were located. But under the Roman Catholic Church, there is only one head of the church, and that is the Pope. 
So there is this view that because there was no pope, if you will, no one head of the church in the New Testaments, in those scriptures, that there shouldn't be one now either. And of course, there are those who say that you need someone who can uh, show the true path, the way that you will achieve heaven, rather than a myriad different routes, some of which may lead to hell instead. Then, of course, you have uh, the idea of the, uh, the Great Schism and of Babylonian captivity, things like this. But basically, it boils down to the idea that uh, a, a couple of generations earlier, there had been an argument between the Pope and the King of Spain. And the king of Spain used his armies to march upon Rome, capture the king, uh, I'm sorry, not of Spain, of France. And the king of France had, in essence, arrested the pope with his military and brought the pope back to France. The pope eventually dies in France. And then there is a conclave, a gathering together of the cardinals in order to try and choose a new pope. And in under this occasion, the French cardinals will gather together and choose a French cardinal who becomes the new pope. Now, the Italian cardinals didn't like that, so they'll gather together and elect an Italian pope who rules from Rome. And then eventually you will also have a third pope from the German cardinals who say, well, everybody else has got one, why can't we? And this creates enormous difficulties. It, it fractures the Roman Catholic Church because who do you believe? Which of the various different popes are you going to listen to? If you listen to the wrong one, you're going to go to hell. You get excommunicated. You get thrown out of the church, your name is crossed out from the book of life. Uh, bells are rung to herald to demons to come and devour you. The light is blown from the candles so that you will have no light to see. All of these kinds of things. It's, it's, it's horrifying to common average everyday people. Now, eventually, this will be rectified, and eventually, the Bishop of Rome becomes the Pope again. But the waves that this creates generations later is still there. There are still people who view this occurrence and, and say to themselves, how could God have allowed this to happen? This is God's perfect church. God has created this. God is perfect. He must have perfect creations. It's, it's perfect. Why would he allow this to happen? Something must be wrong. And as a result, when questions about the church again rise up, people look back and say, ah, yes, of course, this is why all of that happened. God was letting us know that these problems were happening in the church, and now we need to purify the church, and then God will smile down upon us once more. There were also those who, and by the way, many of these things had been claimed by people for a considerable period of time. Most of those individuals, however, had run afoul of the church, and if they were not silenced by the church, then the uh, government in which they lived would be pressured by the church to arrest them, and then they would be tried for heresy and burnt at the stake, or something horrible would happen to them. And thus, those voices of dissent would be wiped away, temporarily. But others would spring up. So, uh, we, we now come to the idea of the ignorance and worldliness of the clergy. 
By ignorance, what they meant was that the vast majority of the clergy within the Roman Catholic Church were priests in very small communities. Most of Europe was comprised of very rural areas where you might have a couple of hundred people in a tiny little village. And that often meant that the priest of that village was someone who had grown up in that village, spent their entire life in that village, and they had served an apprenticeship within the church itself started out maybe as a choir boy and then moved up and eventually becomes the priest of that particular little church in that particular little town. And this happens generation after generation after generation. Many of these priests do not know how to read or write. They've never read the Bible before. They've only heard orally the stories that have been passed down from generation to generation of the Bible. They may have perhaps the uh, stained glass windows with images of various events that have taken place in the Bible as a record of what had been taking place. And if you've ever played um, the old elementary school game of telephone, or in my day it was called the telegraph, <laughs> Yeah, I'm that old. So anyway, the game is, in essence, that the teacher whispers into the ear of one student um, something, and then that student turns around and whispers it into the ear of the next student, and so on and so on until the entire class has heard it. And then the last student stands up and tells what it was that they were told. And the vast majority of time, it's not even close to what had been originally said. And so when they speak of ignorance within the church, they are speaking about these country priests who, in essence, knew almost nothing about uh, the Bible or even about the church's teachings. And there were those who wanted to rectify this. They wanted to fix this by creating schools for priests. Now, eventually, later, when you get to the Catholic Reformation, which takes place after the Protestant Reformation, you will find that the Roman Catholic Church will set up schools for priests. But they don't do it at this time because it is enormously expensive. You would have to build new buildings to house the schools and the students. You'd have to feed them, clothe them. You'd have to buy books, all of these things. And books are not cheap. And as a result, the church, which, while it is enormously wealthy, it is more wealthy than any single nation or large groups of nations in all of Europe. It owns about a third of all the land in Europe, and it's usually the best, the richest, the most fertile land. They receive this as uh, gifts from uh, patrons of the church, uh, as a way to give thanks to God as a way to uh, alleviate some of their guilt or sin for actions that they may have done. All kinds of reasons. So the church has a huge amount of land, and land is the primary driving force for the European economy at this time. Uh, 14th, 15th, 16th century, way before then. And and for a considerable period after that as well. But at any rate, it is agriculture that the church has an enormous footprint in. It owns farms, it owns ranches, and it also owns businesses that take care of the various different um, agricultural functions. So it has granaries, 
it has milleries, it has bakeries, it's got a, pretty much everything. And in addition to all of that, the church also collects tithes. Tithes are a kind of religious tax that people pay to the church for being a member of the church to help the church do its various different functions. And that's usually maybe about 10% of an individual's income. Now, this is a period of time that we're talking about in which money isn't a big factor in the economy. So what most people do is, rather than money, they give what they have. And most people, being farmers, will therefore give farm produce. Wheat, rye, uh, pigs, chickens, goats, all of these kinds of things. And the church then takes those and they do a wide variety of things with it. Now the church feeds members of uh, its clergy. That includes uh, priests and monks and nuns and a variety of other individuals as well. They also are the only institution in all of Europe that feeds and houses and cares for the poor, the sick, the um, orphans, uh, the destitute. They are the only charitable organization in Europe, and there are a lot of people in need. So the church, while it does have an enormous amount of income, an enormous amount of money, it is fabulously wealthy. Much of that is spent in caring for their fellow man. But in addition to that, they also have to build new churches or new monasteries or new nunneries, uh, new poor houses. They have to um, pay uh, salaries to individuals who work for the church but are not uh, priests or monks or something of that nature uh, because there are businesses, as I said, uh, that the church runs and they're not all run uh, by uh, monks or priests. You have lay individuals who will come in, just regular people from the town who will come in and work at the uh, church-owned millery. And they're paid for this. And usually the church pays much better than your average everyday uh, entrepreneur. Because the church, and, and usually the working conditions and working hours are better as well, because the church is a charitable organization. It's there for the betterment of the people, whereas a business is there to make money, to make the owner of the business wealthy. So the church has an enormous amount of expenditures, and they did not believe that they had the financial means to be able to create this vast new infrastructure of uh, schools for priests. So that's put aside until, as I've said, you get to the Catholic Reformation. Then we come to the worldliness. Oh, now, I, I should also make mention of the fact that not every priest, not every monk, within the church, not every nun within the church, is um, ignorant of literature or science or math or any of that other stuff. There are some who are enormously well-educated. The problem, however, is that education is not free and it's fairly expensive. And that means that unless you come from a well-off family, you're not usually going to have the uh, ability to be able to get an education. So there are a number of people within the church who are highly educated. 
but the vast majority are not. Uh, worldliness. Now, what they mean by worldliness is a variety of different things. The first is that at the very highest levels of the church, the bishops and cardinals and uh, the secretaries of the bishops and cardinals and their little inner circle, the princes of the church live the lifestyle of the aristocracy. In fact, many of them come from the aristocracy. They're probably second uh, sons or third sons, something of that nature. And they are in the church more often than not as a way for them to continue to live a nice lifestyle. Many bishops, cardinals, etc., this hierarchy of the church, live fabulous lives that the peasants can only imagine, or maybe they can't even imagine. They have no idea. There are those who are uh, who have multiple clothes, multiple wardrobes, uh, with finest materials used. They have uh, gold and silver jewelry and uh, diamonds and emeralds and rubies and pearls and fabulous wealth. In addition, uh, there are princes of the church who will have uh, fabulous parties that they will give to not just members of the church, but also uh, lay individuals, the other aristocracy, maybe their cousins. And uh, again, this, this is using the wealth of the church for their own personal gain. And there were those who were calling for an end to that, that there were people who were hungry, who were starving, who were um, living on the edge of survival. And that money could be used to help them. But again, the power within the church, those who had the, the power to be able to make change within the church, didn't want this to change because they were the ones who were benefiting from all of this. Few people would willingly want to reduce the way that they live, even if it's for the betterment of somebody else. Well, hey, it's not my problem. All I know is me. I want to live the best I can. So, for the most part, they are not going to change this until you get to the Catholic Reformation. And then lots and lots of things are going to change within the Roman Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church of today is not the same Roman Catholic Church as existed before the Protestant Reformation. There are many different changes that have occurred. Uh, in addition, there were those in the lay community who recognized that the church was well off, and they also realized that if you wanted three square meals a day, which most peasants aren't able to get, if you wanted three meals a day, you wanted a nice roof over your head and an easy job in life, you entered into the priesthood. Even being a monk, most of the monasteries were very easygoing. If you uh, have seen images of Robin Hood and his merry men and Friar Tuck, Friar Tuck is a monk. And he's not an emaciated individual. He is usually portrayed as heavy set, and usually a cask of wine under one arm and a, a turkey leg, well maybe not a turkey leg, but a a, a, um, a haunch of venison in the other. So people recognized that the church was living an 
excess lifestyle. And there were many in the church from top to bottom who weren't all that willing to comply with their oaths to the church, if you will, meaning that many of them will have mistresses, for example, sexual relations outside of marriage, because, of course, a priest, a monk, a nun can't get married. Nuns aren't actually technically married to the church, so you can't. But it was common knowledge to most people, whether it was true or not, but it was common knowledge amongst the people that many within the church were having sexual relations. In fact, there were many rumors about um, uh, nunneries being little more than brothels. And they could point to uh, nunneries that had been abandoned and their walls had fallen down over time. And they could point to little baby skeletons that had been interred into the walls of these nunneries and say, ah, you see, they've had illegitimate children and they murdered them and then put them into the wall so that no one would know the sex that was going on in these places. And that's not true. The truth, of, but they thought that it was. The truth is that at that time, the church believed that if a, a child died before it was baptized, it was doomed to go to hell. And no mother in her right mind is going to want her child to go to hell. They want something for their child. And, of course, the, the church is adamant about, eh, sorry, not baptized. You can't bury it in hallowed ground. Therefore, your kid's going to be wandering the earth forever. And it's, it's just unpleasant all, all around. So what will generally happen is that these mothers will take their child to a nunnery and beg the nuns to allow their child to find some rest, some protection. And the nuns, being a little more kind-hearted than the rest of the church, perhaps, they will then take the child, and while they can't bury it on the grounds of the nunnery, because the priest does come and give to the nuns um, a, a sermon and uh, the supper and, and all of that type of stuff, because they can't do that themselves. But they um, are reliant on the priest to do that. And if he were to see uh, these little grave sites with these little unbaptized children in them, he'd get upset about that. So instead, they would hide them in the walls. And this is hallowed ground. It's their ground. And so these little children would at least find some rest there. But everyone believed these kinds of stories that were circulating around. Because, of course, you know, they, they could see many examples of people who were living very worldly lives, who cared more about living well in this life than in the next. Other problems within the church that have um, circulated for considerable periods of time, people have pointed them out for quite some time, is uh, that of the practice that's known as simony, basically selling off the various different offices within the church to the highest bidder. And this occurs even at the very highest levels. You want to be a pope? Well, hey, you, you got enough money, you can get yourself or your nephew or someone in your family to be pope. A bishop? Not a problem. Cardinal? Not a problem. Or you want another office in a lay position for one of your family members. You want them to be the head of the winery, uh, the head of the granary. You make a donation to the church. The church then says, oh, yes, this is a sure sign of God's favor. Because there is this 
real belief that God takes care of those that he loves and punishes those that he does not. So the rich, because they're rich, they can live a nice lifestyle, God must love them. God must favor them. And so what they do is what God wants done. So if they give a portion of God's favor to the church, again, this is a sign that God wants this man's idiot nephew to become the new head of the granary. Makes perfect logical sense to them. But there were those who said, no, we shouldn't do that. Instead, what we should do is we should choose for that position an individual who is best suited for that position. But of course, the heads of the church, the individuals who made the rules, who could change the rules, who could fix all of this, benefited from this and so therefore did not change it. This is one of the big reasons how it is that the church became so wealthy. Many people will donate to the church to receive favors from the church. Other problems that people saw that they wanted to purify from the church, to fix within the church, is the practice of nepotism. So once you become, you've had your nephew become the Bishop of Milan. Now as the Bishop of Milan, they have massive amounts of power and they can choose to put a cousin, let's say, into the position as the head of the granary within their bishopric. And uh, their other cousin as the head of the winery and so on and so on. So you find that once wealthy individual families gain control of the church, they gain control of the church in all of its facets. And there were those who said, well, that doesn't seem very fair to me. And they wanted that change. But again, the church will not alter this, will not change this until you get the Catholic Reformation when they begin to realize that the church must either change or it will die. The other is the practice of pluralism, which is where an individual within the church will have multiple positions. They'll be the bishop of Milan, they'll also be the head of the granary and the head of the winery. Now, they cannot perform all of these services. I mean, these are full-time positions. These are full-time jobs. And you can't, there are not 72 hours a day in the day. There's only 24. You can only do so much. So there were those who said, well, this isn't good for the church. But again, those in power, those in control, those who had the ability to change and alter all of these things didn't want this changed because they benefited from it. They got the salary of the bishop free, they got the, the salary as the head of the granary, the head of the winery, all of this type of thing. Now it meant that those positions suffered because they were unable to uh, do their job, but eh, so be it. They were benefiting from it. And then we come to the idea of indulgences. And this is kind of the straw that breaks the camel's back. It's that last big thing that pushes people over the edge and propels the Protestant Reformation along into this great bonfire that burns through much of at least Northern Europe. Now, the idea of indulgences is um, a fundamental idea within the church. And indeed, it is still one that is present within the church. It's just not quite practiced in that way today. So what is an indulgence? Well, an indulgence is basically a piece of paper that, exemplify, that uh, exonerates someone from the sin that they have committed. 
or um, the church itself is in the business of forgiveness. Everybody sins, nobody's perfect, everybody makes mistakes slash sins. Everybody. And that means everybody's going to hell. The only way you can get out of that is by forgiveness. And the church says that you gain forgiveness through the church. The method was, in essence, that you would go and profess your sin to a priest. And the priest would say, ah, yes, my son, it is a grave sin you have done uh, wrong, but you are uh, contrite. You want forgiveness, but you must now show that you are contrite, that you want forgiveness and you're willing to do something for that. So usually you have to do something to show that you are worthy of that forgiveness, that you truly deserve that forgiveness, that you want that forgiveness badly. So uh, sometimes uh, you may have to say five Hail Marys and ten Our Fathers. Uh, maybe you will have to do something else. But generally, it is good works that will help to balance out your having committed a sin, having done something wrong. But it is the church that is the intermediary that allows this to take place. Now, an indulgence is a, 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 a bit different in that rather than saying five Hail Marys and ten Our Fathers, you donate to the church land, some goats, money. And a lot of these indulgences take place in town, so there's a lot of money that's being pushed around with this. Money is very big in towns and cities. Now, there aren't very many of them, and they're not very large at this time, but it is growing. So, this is a way that the church generates a good deal of wealth. And uh, this wealth is a symbol, a sign of your contrition, of your desire to say you're sorry for having committed the sin. You're sorry, you really don't, you didn't want to do it, and <sighs> forgive me. So indulgences are a way to show that you have done something to earn forgiveness. <clears throat> now, indulgences really become <clears throat> very big just before the Protestant Reformation takes off because the Roman Catholic Church was in great need of great wealth, more than they already had. <clears throat> and the reason that they needed it was because of the fact that uh, nation states were becoming wealthier and more powerful. So in a number of areas, they were beginning to rival the power and authority of the church. So what the church had decided to do was to tear down the old, small, little uh, church of St. Peter's, uh, where Peter, the first bishop of Rome, had been buried and the church had been built over that and to create instead a massive new building. And you can see it today. It is huge, and it is made with all of the finest materials, because you, know, you don't want to 
put in cheap stuff, God's going to know the difference. So where it looks like gold, it's gold. The finest artisans are used to make all of these types of things. So it is going to be an enormously financially draining venture for the Roman Catholic Church. And they need vast new sums of money. So they come up with this idea of sending out massive amounts of indulgences. And the idea was that pieces of paper would have the signature of the Pope, uh, the authority of the church, stamped, signed, sealed, and there would be blank spaces left open for the name of the individual and their sins to be filled in. And these papers would be handed over in exchange for wealth. A sign of contrition. A sign that someone was sorry. They may not have the time to go and clean all of the latrines in uh, the nearby monastery with a toothbrush. So instead, they donate money or land or something. So... The problem with this, now normally uh, the church forgives sin by having an individual come in, as I said, and uh, confess their sin to the priest. The priest then says, ah, yes, I uh, understand my son, uh, do this and you will be forgiven. The problem with indulgences is, first of all, writing is involved and the vast majority of the priesthood cannot read or write so right off the bat just with that that disqualifies the the vast number of people within the church to be able to do this type of thing the other problem was that not only were they the priesthood primarily illiterate but they also didn't know how to add, subtract, divide, multiply, or make change. And that becomes a problem also. Because if somebody comes in and they've got a, a gold coin and their sin, which is on special sale today, is only five silver pieces, how do you make change from one gold piece? How are you going to do that? Oh. How much is one gold piece worth? Uh, 20 silver pieces? Uh, how much is 20? I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I can't count. So you've got lots of problems. So what the church decides to do is something that the Protestant reformers are just beside themselves with fury over. And that is that the church sells blocks of these papers, these indulgences, to merchants. Merchants who know how to read and write, so they can fill in the blanks. Merchants who know how to make change. And the merchants then go out and sell these indulgences at profit. Not a lot of profit. Many of these uh, indulgence merchants, merchants do not really make a lot of money. But they do make some money. There's not a lot of return, but eh, you know, it, it makes money. But it is because these individuals are merchants and not ordained priests that many of the Protestant reformers are most upset about. There is another problem that they're upset about as well in that... They believe that uh, the church can forgive individuals of sin, but it should be freely given. As it says in the Bible, uh, Jesus freely gives forgiveness of sin to individuals. So they had a kind of a problem with the money aspect of forgiving of sins, because, hey, if you're really poor, you really can't afford those five silver pieces for that sin. So 
that poses a problem. The poor are being shafted here. So for these reasons, you have individuals like Martin Luther who are very upset about this, and they want an open discussion about this practice within the church to try and pressure the church to remove it. And the church is upset about this, and individuals like Martin Luther are warned to stop. You cannot talk about this. You cannot go against the church's rulings. You are a priest. You follow what the church tells you to do. But because Martin Luther is an individual who is firmly convinced that he is right about this, he will fight on. Now, under normal circumstances, the state would eventually have bowed to the pressure of the church and arrested Martin Luther, and then he would have been brought up on charges of heresy and whatever else the church wanted to charge him with, and he'd have been killed. However, because of the rise of powerful nation states, you have individuals who can exercise great power within local areas who can protect these individuals. And it is indeed one of these individuals that Martin Luther will have as his protector against the church. And he can then continue to do something that no other individual in previous generations had been able to do, continue to denounce the church, continue to show the problems of the church. And because of that, you will find more and more people are going to listen, more and more people are going to believe, more and more people are going to leave the Roman Catholic Church. And of course, money is a factor in all of this as well. Money is a factor in pretty much everything that human beings are associated with. Money makes the world go round. Now, <clears throat> local rulers had basically had to do pretty much whatever the church said, because if you didn't, the church could uh, basically kick you out of the church, and uh, if you're not a member of the church, nobody has to listen to you. Nobody has to do what you say. So if you were a count or a duke, an earl, even a king, you might basically just be thrown out. That is until the economy began to heat up in Europe once more, more money slowing around, and these individuals, the aristocracy, begins to have the wealth to build their own little armies, their own little power, and they can begin to say no to the Roman Catholic Church. So when Martin Luther and others, Protestant reformers, begin to tell these local rulers, hey, not only can you purify the church, fix all of these religious problems by overthrowing the Roman Catholic Church and creating a new church that's local, where you can be the head of that church and gain more power and authority for yourself, but you can also gain a great deal of wealth, which is a sure sign of God's blessing, a sure sign that God is down with what it is that you're doing. Because if God didn't want you to do something, he would intervene and he would strip away all the good stuff from you. You get poor. So if you get rich, it's a sure sign God wants you to do what you're doing. So, the tax revenue, the tithes, that the church had been siphoning away from local communities into the hands of the central church in, in Rome, in Italy. All of that tax money now could stay within the local community. That's an extra 10% of pretty much everything right then and there. The other thing is that the lands that the church owned, you could seize 
claim it as your own. And indeed, uh, a good example of that is in England, where the king of England becomes vastly wealthier by doing exactly that. And of course, there were other reasons as well. Uh, there were, uh, with the development of the printing press, ideas of these Protestant reformers are being disseminated around far more than had ever been uh, able to have been done previously. Books, pamphlets, magazines, newspapers, all kinds of things can be now very quickly and cheaply published, and more and more people will have these ideas in their hands. And not only are they going to become face-to-face uh, -face with the religious problems within the church, but they're also going to be shown that with the new understanding of science that is also coming about at this time, that ch the church has been wrong on many different other topics as well, not just religious. For example, the church's stance that it is the sun that goes round the earth can now be shown to be incorrect. And if they are incorrect about something so fundamental, they can be wrong about virtually any and everything else as well. And that is a persuasive argument that people will have and tell them, hey, they're wrong with this. Obviously, they're probably wrong with all the other stuff as well. And into this mix, of course, is the arrival uh, and discovery of the New World, a region of land with people who aren't described in the Bible, and that the church had no idea existed. How is it, again, that the church wouldn't know that these things existed, that these people existed. There was a great debate for a long period of time whether or not, because they weren't described in the Bible, did they have a soul at all then? They're not in the Bible, therefore they're not in God's plan. Do they have a soul? Now, eventually, of course, the church will say, yes, they do. But it highlights this disturbing idea in people's minds that the church doesn't know what it's talking about. It doesn't know everything. It's not infallible. And so for all of these reasons, and others as well, I haven't put down everything here, but for these and other reasons, people will turn from the Roman Catholic Church towards the Protestant churches. And in the next lecture, we will look at the development of one particular Protestant church, that of the Anglican Church, the Church of England, and see how that develops. All right. Thank you.